Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Are You a Robot podcast, a series that aims to tackle some of the greatest challenges and questions that we have in the AI ethics space. Every episode, we're bringing on some of the top minds in the business in their respective fields that have anything to do with data ethics, AI ethics, and governance. We want to create a space where people can talk about these issues that we're all exploring together and we're all living through this time of change. And we want to make some place where there is this dialogue that is happening. And so for that, we've created a Slack community. I encourage you, if you are at all interested in any of this stuff, Jump into the Slack community, let your voice be heard, let us know if we're missing anything and if you want to hear about any certain topics. That being said, I want to give a big shout out to our sponsors and the ones who are bringing you this podcast, Ethics Grade. They're an ESG technology benchmarking firm specialized in governance. Lines up right with what we're doing so ethics grade, check them out. You can find all the information in the link below. We've got a very special episode today for you. We'll be talking with Harriet Moore about what jobs are okay for AI to take, what ones aren't. Ethically speaking, are we okay with having our children be looked after by a robot, but not having a book be written by a robot or vice versa? We, we definitely dive deeper into universal basic income and what she explains in her book. She wrote a novel that I highly encourage you all to check out. The name is In the Gleaming Light. You can find all the links to that in the description. If you're interested at all in sci-fi novels, go check it out. But without further ado, let's talk with Harriet Moore. Are you a robot? Welcome, everyone, to another edition of our Are You a Robot podcast. Today, I am joined by the lovely Harriet Moore. Thank you for being here with us, Harriet. Thanks for having me. Very excited to be here. And we have already gotten all of the pleasantries out of the way. And <laughs> But I want to let everyone know what we are doing here, why you are here with us today. You are like a double agent, we could say. You're working at a large corporation during the day, Liberty Mutual, which I'm sure a lot of people have heard of. And then at night, you write sci-fi fiction. Well, sci-fi, I guess the fiction is implied there, but you write sci-fi books and you are also able to find time to be a parent. I would love to hear a little bit about how you managed to be where you are. I know you went through a stint of entrepreneurship and you have gone through many different roles over time. So can you give us a bit of background on you yourself? Yeah, of course. Yeah. So I started in the insurance industry straight out of university um, and I did a number of different roles there, but mainly focused around change management, large projects, innovation, and and launching new products. Um, so it was kind of possibly the more interesting side of insurance, if that's if that's possible. Um, so and from there, I, I also set up an innovation capability for an insurance uh, company. So really looking at the future, te- future technology, how that was going to impact the insurance industry and how insurance should react to that technology and, and best and make best use of it. I had a a brief stint where I was a startup founder where uh, we launched a pre-mixed sparkling coconut water and vodka cocktail. So (laughs) I had some experience on that side. Sounds Um, delicious, by the way. It was delicious. Um, And a bit of a departure from the insurance, the insurance world. Um, um, And then I, you know, I've also worked in the startup. I've worked for an insured tech startup doing artificial intelligence, machine learning, and um, creating modern insurance platforms. So I've had a bit of a diverse background. um, Mm -hmm. And I've also always loved books. I've loved reading. um, I enjoy writing. So 
I um, have written a number of books and self-published those. And um, I, the one that we're talking about today in The Gleaming Light is really focused on the future of technology, the future of work and universal basic income and the impact that might have on our world. Yeah, and for everyone out there that would like to know, we wanted to frame this chat around when the robots take our jobs, right? That is kind of the idea here. And so I thought that it was interesting that you put the when and not the if. Can you explain what your ideas around that are? Yeah, sure. And, you know, I would say that I am I'm a bit on the fence about whether they definitely will take all of our jobs and whether we'll be able to, um, the economy will be able to create new jobs at a rate fast enough to, you know, to not cause us issues. Um, but I think it's inevitable at this point that technology is going to take vast swathes of the jobs that exist today as we know them. Um, and not just um, low page work, not just, you know, it's not just going to be autonomous cars and, and autonomous trucks taking those jobs. It's also going to be solicitors. It's also going to be doctors. It's going to be, you know, everybody is going to be affected by this. So, um, you know, for me, I think I don't know what happens from there. And I think there are a number of scenarios. So I think some there's a scenario whereby everyone finds additional work, new jobs that we don't even understand or, you know, couldn't comprehend yet mm, yep. suddenly pop up. But I also think there's a world where that doesn't happen. And then we have a huge number of people who are out of work and, you know, governments are going to have to step in to do something to support those people. And so I love where universal basic income comes in. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. So I love the idea that you have spent a lot of time and effort trying to figure out what the future looks like and even writing it down and really like pouring a lot of energy into this, right? And so in your vision, what I'm wondering is now that we are in 2020, is it is it hard to say that we're very far off from what you imagine the future to be or in your books is that something that you don't think will happen so my my books I tried to make it very realistic and you know I tried to think based on everything that I know everything I've read about everything I've experienced um what do I think the world is going to look like in 30 years time and if universal basic income is brought in that's you know what does this mean for people how do, you know how does this impact everyone's day-to-day -day lives you know I'm not really into sci-fi that's like very heavy on the technology and you know and really cares about that I care about the social aspects and what this means for people and their lives so you know for me it was when I was writing the book it was really trying to yeah to try to imagine something that was realistic I have taken certain artistic you know liberties in terms of um I have Hyperloop technology in there, for example, um, and I've assumed that we have huge Hyperloop infrastructure throughout the UK by, you know, 30 years in the future, which may be questionable, but, you know, <laughs> I really love the idea of Hyperloop technology and I, you know, I think it's something that hopefully will be uh, something that we have increasingly in the future. So, you know, I also wanted to bring things like that in. But for the most part, I think it's a realistic portrayal of where we could end up. Um, you know, huge numbers of people without jobs having to, so I even have a cap around working hours because it's, it's almost a privilege to work in that environment. Um, I have, you know, capped jobs and uncapped jobs. So for those that, those jobs that require really a huge, you know, a, a huge number of work hours. So people who lead technology companies, people who are doing, you know, governmental roles, um, might need an uncapped role but then to make it fairer on the rest of the population I, I have this notion of a of an hours cap where people are only allowed to work 20 hours a week um, over and above their universal basic income which everyone gets um, and then you know that's an interesting dynamic to kind of consider that we might have to do something like that uh, yeah this rationing of work is something that you don't really think of when you start to imagine a future with universal basic income, I think the easiest thing to think of is that, wow, we can go and 
be on the beach all day and still have enough money to eat and get our basic needs met. But for those people there are that do need to work or do want to work, they would only be allowed to work a certain amount of time is something really interesting. And I, I like how you explore that idea. Yeah. And I mean, it's, it's a kind of flips on its head. The attitude that most people have today is like, you know, I have to work and that's terrible. Um, and I don't really like mm-hmm. my job. I think given a situation where you're not allowed to work because there aren't any jobs, then maybe your attitude towards those things will, will switch a bit. So how soon do you feel we should be implementing this and stepping away from sci-fi now, mm-hmm. stepping into our world where we are in 2020 these days? Do you feel like we should be implementing this UBI soon or is it something that we can let happen once we see a big uptick in the amount of job loss that happens? I think we need to prepare. So I don't think it's a foregone conclusion that UBI is the only answer. Um, I think what we should be doing is acknowledging that this is something that is coming, whether we like it or not. You know, I think at this stage, the technological innovation that is going on is like an avalanche coming downhill and no one is going to be able to stand in the way of that. So, you know, therefore we are going to experience huge change. Therefore, we should be thinking about it and how that impacts our world and our society. I think the difficulty we have is that whose job is it to think about these things? Mm. Governments. You know, and the way that our governments are set up makes it very difficult for people to have meaningful conversations about these things. Mm. So, you know, you're not going to win an election campaign talking about universal basic income, even though, you know, people have tried. Um, (laughs) You're... you know that's not it's not the here and the now that people really care about you know we're in 2020 covid is more of a problem for our daily lives than this right now and you know i think it's kind of the same reason why we've ended up where we are with privacy regulation for social media for example you know it kind of happens no one cares about it until it's too late um and and then the ship has sailed and it's very difficult to to go and get it back yeah it's like we don't care about it until we start seeing the negative side effects. And then like you say, oops, what are we going to do now? So I I wanted to explore a little bit. You said that the jury's still out on whether or not UBI is the way forward. What other ways do you see being possibilities? I mean, I think at this point, there aren't any other obvious options. I think that the real options are, do nothing and the economy sorts it out one way or another Mm. or universal basic income is the thing that helps us sort it out. I think, you know, I I don't have any other, this is a a genius third way that we could, you know, we could implement um, maybe a hybrid approach, I guess, of those two things. I don't know what that would look like. Um, Maybe more rationing instead of it being universal total universal basic income but again then as soon as you get into having to administer these things and discern who is eligible who's not costs huge amounts of money so maybe not um you know I, I don't have an answer i think the thing that concerns me maybe a little bit is that universal basic income has been presented as the only way mm. and it's it's almost becoming an avalanche in a way you know it's that thing that's gaining a lot of momentum and all of a sudden it's the thing that we're doing and no one's really agreed that it is the thing that we're doing um so again, I think it's a hugely difficult problem, and how do we solve that? Um, I don't know. Well, think, and for me, it's, it's just about having the conversations in an intentional way now, knowing that this is mm-hmm. going to be something that we need to to think about seriously going forward. Yeah, because we have the foresight now; we can see it coming. And I think you put it well when you say it's an avalanche that's coming down the hill. We can see the avalanche coming. Do we want to get buried or not? Yeah, So exactly. the idea that I was wondering about in this, this, the robots take the jobs and what jobs are we going to freely give up? Like I think we had mentioned beforehand, it's great to have a robot do surgery if it's going to be much more uh, accurate or there's a higher chance of survival, especially, right? I would much, you, you said it yourself, you would much rather prefer 
a robot to do that job. Now, if we are looking at jobs like taking care of our kids, do we want robots to be doing that job? Or where is the line when we say a robot can do that, but not that? Yeah. And again, like there are no right and wrong answers. And so I think this is one of the the, the real difficulties here is that it's not black and white. Um, so, you know, okay, fine. Do I want the, do I want robots looking after my children? No, personally, I do not want robots looking after my children. Okay. Well, what happens if it's a child who's in a very difficult, you know, personal situation, who's been born to parents who are addicted to drugs, who, you know, who is not getting the care that they need in that environment? Is, you know, is it better to be looked after by a robot? I mean, that's a very controversial thing to say, but is it better for those for that child to be looked after in that way? And or for robots to at least assist parents in looking after their children? I don't know. But then you get into very dangerous social um, conversations around, you know, well, is who's in charge of the robot who's looking after the child? And yeah. I think this is... This is the thing about the social media algorithm storm that is happening at the moment. Okay. You know, who's in charge of the algorithm that is brainwashing society? Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's extremely difficult ethically because it, it, who even gets to make those decisions? And the reality is we won't make those decisions. Nobody's going to intentionally make those decisions. People are going to put robots in the market that do certain jobs that someone is willing to pay for and people will pay for them and they will have unintended consequences and then we're going to have to deal with it. Um, you know, and, and how much can we get ahead of that problem and how much, uh, how much can we not get ahead of that problem? And we just have to say, okay, we inevitably we know that we are going to have issues that we are going to have to deal with. Hmm. It, it's an interesting one. <laughs> And I find that fascinating, this idea of, well, they're going to go out into the market and people will vote for it with their dollars or their euros or pounds or whatever they currency, right? They buy this product and then it has these consequences that we may or may not foresee. But who is the person or who is the body of governance on all of this? And why is it that they get chosen to govern this, right? So right now, let, let's be honest, it's, there's not really a body of governance, right? It's yeah. completely like you just do whatever you want. You put whatever kind of robot out there that you want and we see what it does. And that is the model that you're talking about with the social media algorithms mm -hmm. where you're saying it was just kind of wild, wild west until we realized, uh-oh, there's bad stuff that's happening here and this can be leveraged by bad actors yep. on top of that so the idea of well, where and how can we set up a, a body of governance or how can we make sure that that doesn't happen is really interesting to explore and it's also something that as far as i know there is nothing on that topic right now maybe you have more insight yeah, I don't think there's anything on that particular topic. I think, for me, it's about understanding how does this stuff actually come about in reality? Hmm. And my experience of how this stuff comes about in reality, especially in larger, larger organisations, is that everything is very fragmented into smaller teams. So hmm. somebody will own the big picture vision, fine. But, you know, underneath that, there are a number of people whose job it is to make specific parts of this technology better. And, you know, when someone is working on the Facebook algorithm or creating the like button, they're not thinking, what, is, what are the long-term social ramifications of this thing that I am creating? They're Such thinking, this is a cool thing that I think people will like who use this technology, you know? And it's very easy for us to turn around retrospectively and say, well, of course, how could they not know? I'm like, well, the world was a very different place then to the, to the world we live in now. No one knew what yeah. like button was back then, you know, um, or anything or anything else, you know. And even the people who created these things, why would they be the right people to even be in the right position to consider the long-term social ramifications? Mm. Like if I'm an engineer yeah. 
and I'm writing the code for this thing, like it's a very different skill to thinking about how is this going to play out in the big picture of the world. Mm-hmm. So, you know, understanding how things are actually built today is that people try and get user feedback from, so assuming something already exists, people try and go and get user feedback, suggest new features, and then they go away and build them and test them. It's a very iterative kind of process. So how do you insert in there some kind of thinking to say, okay, well, if we do this, will there be some social ramifications? Can we think about everything that we already know and using everything we know, are we about to make the world a better or a worse place? Mm. However, that's not the only dynamic that these people are dealing with. So it's not a case of, are we going to make the world a better or worse place? It's, are we going to make more money? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I think fundamentally this is where some of the the, uh, the, the tension comes in as well, because everyone in these organizations also wants to make more money and they want a bonus and they want their product to do well. And, you know, um, one of the reasons people cite for not being able to do anything about the current Facebook algorithm piece is that it would be detrimental to the capitalist interests of that company Mm. and to the shareholders who own that company. And that's a legitimate thing to say, given the way that we're set up. But then we, you know, those two things are in direct conflict with each other. We know people are there are all these adverse impacts that are happening because of people using these platforms. And the reason we can't do anything about it is because it's going to affect a small number of shareholders. Such a fascinating point. Such and such a dilemma that we've been stuck with in a way. And so trying to architect the future so that we don't get ourselves into that pickle again is where a lot of this work is going to come in, right? And so I'm wondering, what would you say, or if you have any advice on when there is a engineer, or especially if someone is working with machine learning or artificial intelligence, and there's a bit of a creepiness factor to what they are doing. But it is like, well, if I create this product, it's potentially going to skyrocket my career. So how do you balance those two? And since there is no governance, what do you do to like not... Basically, what do you do to encourage those people to have a moral conscience? Um, and like you said, sometimes it's not so clear that we don't know how this will be used in 10 years, right? And so I'm just wondering if you have any any wisdom to pass on with that. Like if we start to see, oh, well, this is a great tool or product that I'm building internally, but it does cross the creepy line a little bit. I'm not sure about it. I don't feel morally okay with this. Yeah, and for me, it comes from the top. So, you know, really no engineer in any company is going to be able to change this. I don't think, I don't think they have enough power. And, you know, product owners might be able to change this, but ultimately product owners are still judged on the financial performance of their products. And so for me, it really comes from the top of a company and the culture of a company and the way that they are telling their employees to develop new products so you know for me those senior people should be thinking about how are we considering the social ramifications of the things that we're doing so one thing that i've been pondering a bit is europe right now really wants to kind of come out and show the world that it is on the stage for machine learning and artificial intelligence. And I'm just wondering, how can you correctly balance this regulation that doesn't stifle innovation, if that makes sense? Because I think that Europe really wants to put a lot of energy and momentum behind these new innovations, but there needs to be some oversight. And we see like Europe is leading it with the data protection laws that we have and and other areas they're they're putting thought into this but how can you walk that line of not killing the innovation but not letting it be the wild wild west 
yeah, it's incredibly difficult. And I think guidance, so, you know, going back to what I was saying before, so I think it's the senior leaders who are the ones that need to take responsibility for this. And where do they go? Who's guiding those senior leaders in terms of actually here's some kind of best practice around what you can do in these scenarios. So, you know, I think there is definitely some room for that. In the same way, so, I, you know, I work in cybersecurity in the same way that there are independent bodies who say, here are all of the things that you might like to consider um, when you're making your your application secure. Maybe there's something similar for, you know, here are all the things that you might like to consider when you're considering this new thing that you're going to build. Mm. So like some some kind of third party that has no interest in it, but has a best practices or a better idea of, they've thought long and hard about these issues. And so if someone is creating a product who hasn't spent that much time thinking about it, they can consult them and see what the the consensus is. Yeah, exactly. And at least, yeah, uh, yeah, completely. And I think something that is independent is very important. I think something that, and, and it has to walk the line of being realistic mm. and usable, but that actually makes people think about what they're doing in an intentional way. I think the difficulty, and you know, I absolutely think that was something that would move us forward from where we are today. At least then people would be forced to, on some level, think about it. I think the, you know, the flip side of that is the teeth that come with it. And I think that's where regulation comes in. And again, you know, people kind of talk about stifling innovation, like it's going to be this, this terrible, the worst thing that could ever happen. And I don't, you know, I, uh, yes, I think regulation is going to stifle innovation a bit. But what's more important, you know, people innovating all of these crazy solutions that man- manipulate all the people and end up in civil war at an extreme, mm. or for innovation to slow down a little bit and that not to happen. Mm. It, yeah. I wonder if it's the the idea or the fear i guess from most is that okay well if we stifle innovation here in europe then somebody else in other parts of the world are going to do it because yep. they don't have that kind of regulation so it's going to happen it's just not going to happen in europe and because it's more difficult in europe then you won't see the investment money pouring in yeah uh, and you know, we live in an international world. I think that might be a tautology. We, you know, we live in a, we, yeah, we, we have to play in the global marketplace. And this is the avalanche coming down the hill. Mm-hmm. So how do we stop it? And has, you know, so from where we are today, you know, GDPR, has that stifled innovation? I don't know. I mean. I don't know. All it does <laughs> for me is make me annoyed when I visit websites. Yeah. <laughs> and I have to accept all cookies. Yeah. I mean, I think there's a real advantage for Europe to go further, honestly, and to kind of lead the world. And for me, how do you solve the problem around social media and around um, the algorithm issue that we've got at the moment? Facebook are not going to solve that problem themselves. Algorithms are not going to solve this problem themselves, you know, and... (laughs) And they have no incentive to. They have a lot of incentive to try and convince the world that they're going to sort it out and then carry on as they are today. <laughs> um, yes. So, you know, how do we actually solve the problem? Well, you need regulators that actually have genuine teeth. And GDPR doesn't really have the kind of teeth that I think are needed to make a meaningful impact. I think it's very good in terms of making people be more intentional, in terms of making people consider these things. But, you know, really, how do you make companies sit up and listen you tax them very heavily you give them you know serious penalties that they have to have to you know adhere to so do you say to facebook in europe or wherever you are not allowed to use your algorithms have to be changed you are not allowed to just put in front of people content that is more and more and more of the same stuff that is more mm. and more and more extreme so that people get are of the opinion that there aren't any other views out there and this is the way that everybody thinks and 
you know, a 15 or 16 year old is probably never going to go and look for the alternative viewpoint unless somebody puts it in front of them. Do we have something where, okay, if your algorithm puts something from an extreme point of view in front of somebody, you have to put a video in front of them that is the flip side of that. And even if they click on it, they know it exists. Yeah. You know, if we're going to manipulate behavior, which is what these algorithms are doing, then you have some kind of social responsibility there. You know, so for me, it's the regulator. It's it's a difficult dynamic. You know, there's this fear that the US and China are going to take off and go and, you know, they're going to be so far ahead of everyone else and no one's going to catch up and it's going to stifle innovation. They already are quite a long way ahead in some ways anyway. You know, they're much, America is a much bigger market. It's a very different market. I think it's much more difficult to regulate. But I think what happens when someone like Europe regulates is that they then set a standard that other people then have to talk about, Mm -hmm. even if they don't do it. Yeah, you see that with GDPR, right? I think in Brazil, they created a data protection. In Mexico, I think there was talk of doing it also. And so it's at least bringing the issue to the forefront. And even if they aren't doing it, maybe it's the innovation that Europe is going to have is on this plane. That is the innovation that you're going to see happening. And then I just wonder if it will, like, because I I look at two totally different markets, like you have China and you have Europe. And with China, and they're not allowing of certain companies like the foreign companies to come in and do whatever they want they have to play by the rules and then you have europe attacking a problem where it's saying okay well let's just let's put a few more regulations on it to make sure that they they also play by the rules and then you have the us that is largely saying do whatever until most recently when uh with the whole tiktok fiasco so there's there's some interesting ways that this is playing out and i think it's going to be very fascinating to watch it unfold in the next year or 5 years even but the ideas that you're bringing to the forefront and saying hey who are these governing bodies who governs the governing bodies or how do they why do they have the right to be the governing bodies that's something that it, we need to think long and hard about Absolutely. Yeah. You know, I would say that America are starting, you know, states within America are starting to look at this and are starting to regulate. Mm. I think it's something that we are going to have to do, whether people like it or not. More regulation is required in these areas, especially when we then start putting robots in our houses around our children, you know, Mm -hmm. walking, they're going to be delivering our mail, they're going to be doing all kinds of things all around us all of the time. And the people in control of those robots are going to have huge amounts of power. You know, so whatever way you look at it, regulation is going to be required one way or another. So we can either wait until it's the avalanche has already hit us and we're already under the snow, or we can do something about it now. So I have a little bit of an ironic question. Do you feel that robots will ever take your job as a writer? <laughs> I mean, I think it's possible. Um, yeah, I mean, why not? I think uh, there's something about human creativity that I think is very interesting. And I think when people talk about artificial intelligence, it's like, are we talking about artificial uh, general intelligence or, you know, something that is, um, I mean, are we talking about robots that can think like a human? Or are we talking about robots that are based on algorithms and basically we have coded to do what we want them to do? Um, Mm -hmm. I feel like the robots we've coded to do what we want them to do, yeah, they'd probably write a book, probably be quite good. We'd probably get better and better over time, could definitely take our jobs. Um, um, I feel like the robot that thinks like a human, I mean... Yeah, I think they could definitely do it. And I think that's probably going to be the least of our worries if that (laughs) that happens. (laughs) Yeah, completely. Well, I'd 
I wanted to bring up this point that we mentioned earlier, um, and it is the idea of robots amplifying our abilities as humans. And I see that as a perfect case for an amplification of our creativity, not an overpowering of it. Like I look at it as, I, I think I mentioned my friend who created a machine learning algorithm that spits out a bunch of MIDI uh, music. And he is the one that gets to choose what sounds each one of these notes makes. And here I, I imagine a day where we can be sitting at home and you're writing your book and you can consult with whatever algorithm it is or robot or whatever, and you can ask about different ways the plot line can go or different ways that this character development can go, right? And so it's not like the robot is writing the story for you. They are just bouncing off ideas and brainstorming with you much like a friend would. And they have much more data because they've read every book in the internet or on the internet. And so they've been able to internalize all different kinds of plot twists and they can give you very fresh and very creative ideas. So that is one way that I think it might not be as much of a dystopian future if we can figure out a way to make it work. Yeah. I mean, I think that it's, it's hugely exciting, you know, that kind of, um, map out all all possible given these inputs these are my characters this is the way that i'm starting the story you know what are all the potential scenarios i um feel like you, yeah and these are the the 10 percent of those scenarios that are most likely to resonate most well with this demographic this demographic yeah. exactly yeah i mean i guess um that could definitely and also this is the book cover that is going to be the most delightful to this demographic. And this is the title that is going to make it stand out. Because I think, mm -hmm. you know, that's the other thing. Books um, are mainly about marketing, as it turns out. Um, <laughs> and, you know, so titles and covers, are very important. Or do they then have, you know, uh, what I would love is for some AI to say, I've read all of the books out there on the market. And I know based on your preferences, here are the top 10 books that you should read next. And every single one of them, you're going to find completely brilliant and you're going to love and you're never going to want to put down. Mm. I mean, finding books to read is, is an impossible challenge because you don't know yeah. what it's like until you're halfway through. So yeah. that would be wonderful. Um, really? Yeah. And that idea, I think, is uh, is very much like what we are hoping for. And, and speaking of books... Can you give us a bit of an idea on, on what people can take away from your books? Like reading your books, what are things that we can take away? Because I know you're tackling these societal problems more than like the heavy tech or what do they call it? The cyberpunks, that yeah. kind of idea. Yeah, my books are, are very much focused on humans, human relationships, and trying to understand a realistic future world and what that might mean for us. I'm not really into the detail of all of how the supercomputers are going to work with each other. Um, so yeah, it's really trying to get people, trying to help people understand what this future world might look like, because it's very difficult to visualize, I think. Um, right. And trying to understand what some of the social, the ethical dilemmas are going to be that we're going to have and what some of our personal dilemmas might might look like. Um, yeah, and just to try and, the takeaway for me is just understand the complexity of this, how much of the world is going to change and, and to, you know, to use it as a way to frame maybe some of the conversations that we're having today. Excellent. So I have one last question for you, Harriet. Are you a robot? <laughs> I'm not, I'm not a robot. Not yet, anyway. Um, <laughs> perfect. Well, thank you so much for joining me today to talk everything ethics and the future universal basic income. I think you have some very insightful points. I really appreciate this and feel a bit smarter from this conversation. Thank you. I've really enjoyed being here. All right. We will see you all later. and. 
I just want to give a shout out in case anyone would like to continue talking about this or any other topic around digi- sorry, data ethics. We are having all kinds of conversations in our Slack community. So jump on. I will leave a link to that in the show notes below. See you all later. Thanks. Bye.